Very cool. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We just got on a little bit early because we want to know who of you has used a typewriter. <laughs> you know, that's kind of weird. I actually learned, uh, Briar, I learned how to type on the typewriter. I love that feedback. Me too. I have a typewriter just so that I can feel that sometimes <laughs> when I'm typing. <laughs> Do they have keyboards that are actually in, in the typewriter design? I don't, I haven't seen them, but I could totally see that being a thing with, um, what's that like Victorian sci-fi mix? Uh, I forget what it's called, but I bet you there are people who have that. That would be really cool. Okay, we got people coming in. So for those of you who just came in, uh, would love to know how many of you have used a typewriter. I'm messing with my microphone here. So just let us know in the chat, right here in the chat on your right. Let us know if you've used a typewriter. I know it sounds like a strange question, but there are actually people who have never used a typewriter before. <laughs> we were going to ask if you've ever used the IBM Select, but I have a feeling that, I mean, I don't even remember what, what typewriter I used. So let's see here. Also, if you have any questions, please put them under the questions and topics tab underneath our video. And then finally, we have uh, people just filing in. So if you'll use the share button again underneath our video to the right uh, to share it out, let people know we're just getting started. I'm hanging out with Briar, and she's in her 1950s era office, <laughs> the SCP mug. I.e. a university office. There you go. My university office is very 1950s, 60s. It's yeah, yeah. I so, actually don't mind it. Victoria says that she's used a typewriter. Victoria, do you know what typewriter it is? We're wondering if you guys know the, the make and model. Uh, Arnold says, as a kid, I, uh, but just because I was curious, I think I messed yeah. it up. Philippe says, hi, me too, in my early school years, yes. I learned how to type on it, so. And I, I do love, um, the feel of it and the feedback. And I kind of wish I had a typewriter just for that. No, yeah, I would love to get one too, Victoria. It'd be nice to get one. Actually, I think in, in my university office prior, there's one hiding in the typewriter return of our shared desk. And I'm just like thinking of stealing oh. it. <laughs> yeah, we have one in our office that gets used for forms still sometimes. Where if they just want to, they want to slip a piece of paper in and add a, just a little bit of text, they can do that a little more easily than doing it on the computer sometimes. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Do they put a piece of carbon in between? Mm-mm. Okay. Just stick the <laughs> paper copies. right in there. I thought to make copies. <laughs> no, no. Okay, great. We still got more people coming in. It's great to hear. Cool. Let's see. Victoria, I remember she's in Portugal. Where's everyone else calling in from? Let's see. I am in Los Angeles, actually now in Pasadena. We moved. And Briar, where are you calling in from? Portland, Oregon. From your office. Yes, at <laughs> Portland State University. Such a nice area. I love Portland. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Does anyone else use the typewriter? Let us know in the chat bar on the right. And then also let's share it out. Let's let everyone know that we're just about to get started. OK, so it's two minutes past, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm here with Briar Levitt. She's our director, producer of the Graphic Means documentary, now coming out. When is it going to be released? Um, we're looking to finish in February. I'm making a trip to uh, Berlin on uh, leaving Sunday to do some final and final, final interviews. Um, but it's pretty much all there. It's just a few more things that I wanted to get in there. So yeah, end of February is what I'm aiming for. That's exciting. Yeah. Yes. And it was looking really good when I saw the screening. Thanks. Yes. I'm excited about it. Especially to get the word out to some of my students. So 
who did did not believe that graphic design was done before the computer. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a whole different perspective and level of respect for yes. your predecessors. Yes, and understanding how much work. I mean, when you know they're saying, "Oh my God, it's so much work to get a print done." It's like you have no idea. <laughs> no, no, it's easy now. Exactly. So, Briar, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into graphic design? How you got to start in the field? Um, I started thinking I was going to be an exhibition designer because I really loved dioramas, honestly, and I wanted to be in museums. And uh, and when I went to school, there weren't any exhibition design programs. There was like one MFA. So I studied graphic design and really fell in love with that and with type and with publishing more so than exhibitions and uh so from there i uh out of school my second job out of school was as art director for bitch magazine and um i've worked for other publishing clients so publishing is where my heart is but i now i'm a filmmaker too so um it's it's a fun time to be a designer because you can just say i'm gonna make a film now and i, I you know the, the access to the tools is just so amazing now and where did the idea come up in terms of to make the film? <clears throat> the idea came up from these books that I've been collecting when I go to the Goodwill, so charity shop um, hunting, which I do a lot of. And I just found these uh, obsolete manuals that I found fascinating with the diagrams and photographs showing step by step all, everything that had to be done before a piece of design could get printed. And I missed that by a few years. I started uh, my education in 96 and my school, San Francisco State had already gone digital at that point. So mm. I, I barely learned, there were little leftovers, but mostly we were completely digital. So it's been fascinating to learn about that stuff. Well, that's good, actually, because when I was in school, we were doing some pay stuff. We had a waxer in class. Um, mm -hmm. But by the time I got into the industry, it was digital anyhow. So it was like, what was, why did I go to school? <laughs> yeah, it was a tough, that would have been a tough period. I call those the hybrid years mm -hmm. because it was a mixture. You might print stuff out from the computer and then paste that down. Um, so that's what we're doing in class after all we were just like oh. typing it up on the computer printing it out and then pasting it down uh -huh. it, was, uh -huh. it was really really hybrid <laughs> yeah i don't know why we were doing that I'm trying to think. i mean it, it's good that you had um at least you got some access to the computers i think it was harder for folks who didn't have any computer training and then all of a sudden they had to get training and there were no classes yet or anything they were sort of teaching each other Right, and especially with the software, mm -hmm. there was no clue. I mean, mm -mm. It took a while for people to catch up. Right, and when designers there was no were being type ED. there was no type ed at all. So <laughs> when they got into the into the world, I mean, they were trying to teach themselves the software, and a lot of creative directors had no clue about the software. So now the younger designers were sort of empowered; those who could teach themselves the software. Which is amazing. Yeah, that and that gets covered a little bit in graphic means. What was it like to be a young designer who actually knew more than their older um, colleagues in some respects? Not everything, but right. they had this certain knowledge that was special. That is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Be kind of an awkward position to be in. Well, thanks. Everyone is coming in now, so let's get started. I'm going to show the uh, presentation. And if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to put them underneath the questions and topics tab underneath our video. Or if you just have little comments, feel free just to put them in the uh, chat bar on the right hand side. Okay, so here you go, Briar. We got it open. Okay, so we're in my, we're on the before desktop publishing page. Yes. Okay, well, speaking of typewriters, I did, I typeset this with my IBM Selectric typewriter. Um, cool. And then I scanned it in <laughs> and, and put it on a different paper. But that is uh, IBM Selectric type. Um, I'm going to warn everyone that I'm getting over a cold, so I might stop to cough or maybe even blow my nose. So excuse me if that happens. Um, so 
my interest in the democratization of typesetting comes from two places. The first place is my long connection with independent publishing. I discovered zines in my early 20s and I made one myself. That one on the left, Rabble Rouser, was the one and only zine that I made with a friend of mine. Um, but in 2001, I was hired as the art director for Bitch Magazine and I became really intimately aware with the costs, the tribulations, but also the rewards of publishing content that wasn't backed by huge amounts of money. <clears throat> Secondly, I realized in around 2013 that I had this pattern of collecting out of date graphic design manuals from my trips to the Goodwill that I mentioned earlier. And I would just be looking at the step by step images, fascinated at the amount of work and also the tools and uh, of the trade. I, you know, I, like any good, you know, like any designer, I am. Uh, I romanticize all the tools of the trade, the pens and the pencils and the rulers and whatnot. Um, so um, this is where the idea came for me to make the movie. Um, this talk will focus on a specific aspect of typesetting before the desktop computer um, that doesn't, that just gets mentioned in the movie, but I go into it a little more deeply in this presentation. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I will also note that this, so we're looking at the democratization of typesetting during the, around the 60s and 70s. Um, so that's the era we'll be focusing on, even though you could argue that the real democratization of um, typesetting started with Gutenberg, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but this was a big one in, uh, uh, in our, you know, some of our lifetimes. Um, of course, Right now, we're experiencing maybe the greatest democratization of design and um, information that we have from uh, page layout software that anyone can purchase to Tumblr uh, and Twitter where you can share your ideas um, or even you can even design a website easily online with uh, platforms like Squarespace. And uh, this is obviously a recent development in the grand scheme of uh, human civilization. Uh, we've been printing for quite a long time. So from the relief prints of China to the Bibles of Gutenberg, printed materials were really only accessible to those people who had the means because there was the cost of preparing substrates, paying scribes to write out each page, the printing equipment, the number of people required to to do the work, all of this stuff costs quite a lot of money uh, um, all the way up until the 20th century, really, when um, we had automation for typesetting with the uh, line caster, which a lot of people know more specifically as either the monotype or the linotype machines. But for this presentation, we are going to move beyond the line caster, which was hot metal type, and talk about tools that be, that really opened up accessibility to people that uh, were affordable enough for someone to bring into their little office space. So not a massive metal Victorian contraption, but um, something that they could actually do in their office space. So Strika was the first uh, example of this kind of typesetting uh, that was more, more accessible. It did start with the newspapers however, um, who were pushing technology forward, not because they had any grand um, ideas about, um, about moving typography forward anything. They just didn't want to continue to pay the uh, union typesetters or compositors who worked on these kinds of hot metal machines. So on the left is a linotype, on the right is a monotype. Both do the same thing as running hot metal through the machines to create um, lines of type that could then be printed. Um, so unions were striking more and more in uh, moving to the 1940s and newspapers reacted by subbing in non-union workers, often were women, to compose the papers on strike-on machines. And strike-on machines are essentially typewriters. So, um, 
here's an example of, of one of those kinds of machines. And this is sort of the beginning of what we can call the cold type era, or the, um, or which is the alternative to hot metal type, or type that's formed with hot metal. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the, here's the Justo writer, which is this, uh, these two machines here, which work in concert together. The type would be entered into the recorder machine, and then a punch tape that was uh, created as you typed would be entered into the reproducer, which would output uh, printed camera-ready type with proportional spacing and justified text. Now, most of you probably have, if you have played with a typewriter, you know that the spacing isn't particular, isn't up to the standards of um, most designers in terms of uh, letter spacing, line spacing, um, et cetera. But some of these other strike on machines that were more sophisticated actually did have proportional spacing and allowed for that. Hmm. Another machine was used by small papers and offices, and, which was the IBM Executive. And this uh, offered quasi-proportional spacing. You can see here that they <laughs> They say letters can be beautiful too. Um, that's what they're referring to, even though they use a pretty lady to indicate that. Um, <clears throat> here's a later version of the IBM executive. And you can see, um, if I move to the next page, how they, from their manual, how they explain the importance of proportional typesetting, why that is superior typesetting. Um, the eyes are the prime you know, example, you just get more elegant type. <clears throat> you could also justify type with the um, IBM executive and with the Frieden Gesto writer. And that was a big deal, especially for uh, newspapers. You definitely need to justify because the pages are so complicated. You could never have a right rag, a soft rag. It would just be a total mess. Um, so it, as you can see, it took, takes a little work and planning to do some justification here. They've got someone drawing a line to give them a guide. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, you could do it. Other competitors were the Fairchild Lithotype Composer. And you can see the woman here sitting at the machine entering uh, type into the machine. On the right is that cabinet which has all the typefaces in it. So they... Uh, advertised that they had a wide selection of typefaces um, that could carry six to 12 point type. So you can see that that's body type. Uh, it offered proportional character spacing, which was critical for anything of um, professional nature, also justification, but then a standard typewriter keyboard. So anyone could come in here and use it. You don't have to be union trained. You know, un the, the keyboards on a linotype are different, um, but this one, it's you could hire anyone to come in and do the typesetting. Another one was the Veritiper, which uh, was used in um, offices and small studios. And um, you can see she's, uh, it's it looks like a typewriter. It's got a few more controls there that allow for uh, adjustments to be made. And I just love this machine because it looks like a monster. And the, uh, Verit the, the image on the left, you know, it talks about the 1,000 faces that it has. I have to assume that they were being cheeky with that copywriting. <laughs> um, but definitely, um, you know, you can see the, the uh, text at the bottom of that looks like a typewriter writes like printing. Um, so it was sort of the best uh, thing for the cost. You know, it's a good value. Uh, here's an example of a very oops, an uh, example of a Veritiper. Wait, is, my machine is kind of going slow. And you can see on the left there the typefaces. Those would snap into the machine. So when uh, in the other image where she had that cabinet of typefaces, that's what it was showing. And you see how small they are compared to the machine in the picture on the on the right. Another composing machine that's falls under the strike on category was the Coxhead um, office composing machine, also a monster looking, which is, I mean, charming really. Um, so these were something that newspapers could use to, if they were bringing in non-union folks, or if you had a small, uh, you know, 
situ you know, studio situation where you needed some typesetting and you didn't need it to be of the highest, highest quality, but you it needed to be better than a, than a typewriter, these would do the job for you. But the machine that won the strike on competition in the end was the IBM Selectric Composer. This was released in 1961, but we're gonna come back to that a little bit later. So the cold typesetting revolution is the next step in our democratization of type in the middle of the century. While strike on systems were gaining use, um, the cold type revolution was gaining steam. Machines could utilize fonts existing in film format, so not in metal and not sitting on, um, you know, inside a typewriter type machine, but in film of some kind. And uh, the, a machine would project light through the film to expose the letter photographically, hence the term photo typesetting or photo setting. And this revolution, that's, this is what a lot of my film talks about, and we'll talk a little bit more about it um, today, but this diagram does a good job of showing what, you know, we've got a light source with a font, so the font is the, is the, um, is the format that your type comes in. Now a font comes as a, as a digital file, but um, in the era of photo setting, it came on either a, a disc or a, um, or a piece of film that could project light through it. Then you had a lens that could, um, that could scale the type. And then you, um, and then that would project onto a piece of paper. And that paper was photosensitive paper. So it would, you know, you'd have to use the typical photographic chemicals to develop your type. From a design perspective, the, this period was most notable for encouraging a proliferation of typeface designs to land on the market. And this was due to the fact that it was much more affordable to manufacture typefaces on film rather than in metal. Uh, and storage was a lot easier. So here's, um, here's a little ad showing off 500 fonts from a, um, from a typeface library. Of course, now everyone has thousands of fonts. <laughs> of course. Um, I mentioned that uh, the fonts came in various formats, but they all shared the commonality that light could be projected through them. So here are some examples of um, fonts that are on film, that are on glass plates, that are on plastic discs um, or glass discs. And um, the reason there are so many is because there were um, there were not copyrights, but um, I always forget the word. Uh, there, there, there were. I can't think of it. Um, they had to change up the formats because people, t because every business owned the right to their own specific uh, format. Like Sony Sorry. and Apple. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so the nice thing about these photo typefaces was that you could overlap type. You could set type very tightly, whether it was tight letting or tight letter spacing. In this case, this layout by Herb Lubalin sets the type, I mean, extremely tight. He's done um, you know, stuff by hand, like cut it and overlay it and things like that. But nevertheless, he's the prime example, Herb Lubalin, of um, photo typesetting being utilized for um, its benefits, which are that it's not metal. You can actually overlap. So the printing industry had begun the transition to cold type around 1949 with the introduction of the photon uh, photo setter. But these machines were massive and very expensive. So um, 82,000 and 1951, not including the, t the cost of typefaces. And in, here we go, by 1963, it's still $62,000. That is a huge um, cost for someone who owns a type shop and maybe has already invested a lot of money in hot metal typefaces and their metal uh, line caster, their linotype machine. Hey, Briar, Miles says yeah. proprietary. Proprietary, that's the correct word? Yeah, proprietary. Yeah. I. I 
you have to register a um, <laughs> forget the word anyway. All right, <laughs> trademark. No. no? Okay. All no. right. These guys are we're we're trying to help here. Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, so anyone wanting to produce a pamphlet or publication with decent quality typography would have to take their their manuscript, which would probably be uh, typewritten on your little typewriter at home, at the office, not a special typewriter, just your regular old typewriter. And then your your type shop would um, set the type for you with um, with proportional spacing, justification. They could um, they could offer up various typefaces, um, and you you had to use a third party uh, person to do this. But activists, small presses, artists, and small organizations like churches and schools often resorted to typewritten copy, and then they'd re reproduce these works um, inexpensively with affordable duplicators like the mimeograph. So here's an example of a church newsletter where they're, you know, for them, it's good enough to use the typewriter. It, they're, they're not going to be so, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, snobby about the type. Um, they just need to get the, they want to get this information out there and the typewriter does the job. <clears throat> so, I mentioned the Selectric Composer before, and um, this machine is was kind of a revelation in um, the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, because as you can see, it looks like a typewriter, although a really big typewriter. Um, but it allowed people to change their typefaces, um, to control letter spacing and justify lines of type. and um, and of course, the IBM executive had already had these features, but the Selectric Composer offered the best quality and ease in setting type, plus the reproduction quality was better. So you can see this woman setting type here, and she has some more controls than the typical uh, typewriter. So you can see her, her page is justified. You can also see like an adjustment um, scale above the keyboard where she can uh, determine the, the um, justification. Um, this is a European version, not that people are <laughs> really going to care, but the American one had a little dial on the right that is more common to be seen. Um, got a little image. This is just a close-up of what the, the font looks like. And in this case, the font comes in this little uh, sphere, which most people just call a golf ball. And here's what it looks like that's that, by the way, that was a snap of my the typewriter in my school's office. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So here's the machine on the left showing it in motion. And then you can see on the right all the typefaces. And um, you you just snap that into your machine. It's fascinating to watch them spin around and um, uh, and do their little job. But again, you can see that type there on the left. That's not that's that's much better quality than a type a regular typewriter could do with because you have proportional spacing and justification and also more control over letting. So here's some examples of type specimens for the, the machine. You could um, it was easy to snap them in and out. You could change a typeface in the middle of a line. Um, hmm. So say you needed italic, you could do that. You didn't have to draw a line underneath to indicate italics later. Um, which is what a lot of people ended up doing with typeface uh, with regular typewriters. Here, they even had a, a ruling font where you could just add. You could make forms on the machine, so you could make a line or a dotted line. You could make vertical rules. Um, most designers would say, "Oh, this is more work. I'd rather just do it with a ruling pen or a rapidograph." But nevertheless, it's they were really thinking ahead in this, um, and I'm sure some people used it. Um, most designers I talked to would say, no, I would use my rapidograph for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's just a cover of their type specimen, or they call it the type styles portfolio. And um, eventually, um, the machine, they came out with uh, machines that could even help automate some of the typesetting. Um, so that was a, that's a, um, that's actually a pretty robust little typesetting system. So let's look at uh, one of the one of the famous users of the 
IBM Selectric was Stuart Brand, who was the publisher of the Whole Earth Catalog, starting in the late 60s. And um, this catalog was sort of simultaneously a reference and a mail order catalog for those wanting to use technology of the day sort of outside the mainstream sphere. And it, you can see here, the pages are a bit chaotic, but th this, all this type you see on this page is set with a, an IBM Selectric. And they sold all kinds of things for people who, you know, either people who were going to live off the, you know, land, homesteaders, or just people wanting to do hobbies. Um, and here, he would also include articles in the publication. So here's a how to do a whole earth catalog. It was all very open source. I mean, for lack of a better word, everything was very open. No one was trying to be proprietary. They're saying you can do this too. We we don't we're not competing. Um, so here's here's his article on doing your own. And you can see on the it's research editing, but then he has a little sidebar there where he just sings the print the praises of the IBM Selectric Composer. In that first um, paragraph, he says, as far as I'm concerned, this is the tool that made our operation possible. That's a hmm. that's pretty, pretty big deal, because uh, Whole Earth Catalog is very iconic. Another bit of type that um, became available to anyone who went, could go and find it at an art store was dry transfer type. That's a general term for what a lot of people refer to as Letraset. Letraset is a brand name. Here are some images from a Letraset catalog to show you all the different uses for the material. But basically, it was high quality typefaces that you would buy um, on the individual sheet and then rub down um, onto your onto your page. And eventually, they started making all kinds of products that allowed you to um, allowed you to um, make signage. You can see a guy making a um, that X-ray on the top right doing signage. Um, they offer all kinds of options for um, adding color to illustrations. Um, I love that stuff. Oh, me too. It's it, it's <laughs> it's so fun to play with. And it and by the way, guys, if you find this at all interesting, you can buy this stuff on eBay or even like my local art store has it. They just have it tucked away in a back room and you have to go and they watch you while you dig through it. But nevertheless, you can get it. <laughs> Here's some other brands, Zipatone and Sharp Pack were other competitors of Letraset. Although Letraset was considered sort of the, the, the king um, and, and the original. Uh, and I find that they're the product if you get old sheets, I think it works better now. If because remember it's decades old, um, it still works pretty well. So while it was originally intended for professional graphic designers, this dry transfer lettering ended up being used by a lot of uh, non-professionals, and and they definitely marketed marketed it that way. They figured that out, and then they really went for it. So here are all the you know folks showing how they've used Electroset. Another um, group of folks who, you, who would use Letraset or dry transfer uh, type were artists. So here we've got some examples. I snapped these photos at the Tate Modern, no, I'm sorry, Tate Britain. Um, and these are some uh, pieces of artwork that um, are booklets. And, um, and one, the one on the left is a booklet, the one on the right is an invitation. But you see here they can create work that has authority to it because they're using um, typefaces, not, um, not just handwriting. Although on the, on the bottom one, it's sort of an illustration. I think that's intentional. But nevertheless, anyone could have these professional looking, uh, access to professional looking type. Also, the one on the right must have taken a long time to set. Well, actually, the body there is just a typewriter, I think. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> but the one the, the, where it says work and alienation, those are classic. I mean, the top one is Cooper Black. I forget what the alienation is, but that's a classic uh, typeface from that era. In fact, I just found an old um, Westworld poster where they use that typeface. Oh. I don't know if anyone's watching Westworld, but go look at the old posters for it. It's awesome. Um, so businesses that may have had trouble getting their uh, their 
work typeset. So here we've got gay businesses or organizations that may have been like, we don't want to mess with the type shop or the type shop doesn't want to mess with us. So we're going to make our own um, materials. They just go to the art shop and buy that stuff themselves. Additionally, of course, the classic, most people think of uh, punks using dry transfer lettering to create flyers and to create album covers and, and whatnot. I think a lot of people might guess that the Sex Pistols famous, never mind the bollocks, is, um, was dry transfer, but I actually found out, I was so curious, he actually, it's just found type. Um, hmm. So that's how he created this still classic and obviously made with very little you know not no expensive typesetting happening here um i'm gonna take a drink of my tea <laughs> <coughs> so for the more advanced user there were machines that allowed for set that allowed for setting a display type on strips of photographic paper and users had really good control over letter spacing and scale and could also do visual tricks like slanting and other distortions. Um, and, you know, with the better the model, the more control you had. So here's this original. It's just a, it's just like a desktop machine. I mean, for lack of a better word, we use that for computers. But um, you've got these strips of film in there that you, you turn the wheels and um, that allows you to set the type. Um, this is a better illustration of probably the most famous headline typesetting machine, and that's the photo typositor. So basically, she's got this massive, it's essentially a dark room um, where she can uh, adjust the uh, strip of type to create her own headline in that strip. And you can see it coming out on the left there. There's a little viewfinder if you look down from her eyes, that she can look through and see the letter being projected down as if she was in the in a dark room, but she can see it there. So she can make really um, specific decisions about how close together the type is. This would only be used for for headers and you know big expressive type, not for body type. Here you can see a little. Um, illustration of, again, of that type being uh, uh, projected down. That's what it would look like inside the machine. And you could expose it onto, you could make film positives, negatives, you do a paper negative or a paper positive. So if you're doing paper, you could just have it print out onto paper, cut that out, paste it down and send it to the printer. Wow. Um, I mean, I make it sound quick. Just cut that out, paste it up. Send it to the printer. <laughs> <right>. So easy. <laughs> um, one really cool thing about the typositor is all these tricks you could do with it. It might, for any of you that are, are um, typographers or, or fine or who are interested in fine typesetting, this might make you feel stressed out to look at the stretching of type. Mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that Rachel tells you not to stretch your type. And um, mm -hmm. I tell my students not to. But it was an exciting time of exploration. And with film, and projection, they could they could play with this kind of thing as as you move the film and how it sits in the light. You could control these things. Um, so they have the you could make type bounce and stagger and put it on an arc. Um, and uh, these were fun tricks for this. You know, you can see this very sixties type uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, this shows that how the typositor was positioning itself. It says, for hire, lettering artists, $15 a week, 24 hours a day, year round. They're saying, you don't need a lettering artist anymore if you buy this machine, which frankly isn't true. Lettering artists, and I bet you there are lettering uh, artists out there in the audience right now. The lettering is a special, you, you're doing very specific custom situations. But never, that was what they were sort of aiming towards is look at all these tricks you can do um, and, and you don't even need to be a, a lettering artist. And then I've got even on the right here an image um, that I got at the printing museum in Massachusetts showing the, the, the price list. So the typographer, 2,400 bucks. That's expensive, but it's not, um, it's not like, you know, $81,000 that the uh, other mm -hmm. type setting machine was. Uh, there were other machines more affordable. So here's one called the Prototype. You can see she's 
uh, I think she's projecting the light with that um, moving light, basically. And you can see it's just for display type. You wouldn't want to set a whole body text moving one letter by one. Um, but the 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 uh, the most affordable option was the strip printer. <laughs> and uh, one of the people I interviewed for graphic means was awesome and found one of these and sent it to me and it came with the uh, it came with the <clears throat> uh, this brochure and the whole brochure is really all about saying look this is the most affordable option in other words we are if you if you really want a photo typositor but you can't afford it this is your one to get so mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> They show the exam, you know, the strip printer offers all these typefaces and you can do these tricks, you can do outlines and patterns and you can see the woman on the right holding, that is a strip, that is a font um, on film that would run through the machine and she'd set one letter at a time. And she's got a case there, just a plastic case with the film rolled up and those are the, that's the font case, that's her font storage. So small compared to those metal cases. <laughs> yeah, you could have this. You could have this in a little. You know, even if you were a business owner and you needed to make ads for the local newspaper, you could then have this machine and save money on typesetting costs, not having to send it out every time. You could train someone in your office to do it. So this is a better uh, illustration of how the machine works. You're just moving the that strip back and forth to get the letters that you want but you'll notice that it's blind you cannot you don't have a viewfinder like the typositor did so you better hope it you know comes out <laughs> your letter spacing probably isn't be, gonna be as good on this one um and here they're really pushing the economical only 20 329 dollars includes 10 typefaces additional fonts only six bucks a pop um, so the strip printer is a funny one. It's, uh, no one, you know, it's, it's not <clears throat> people reminisce about the typositor, but I haven't had anyone really reminisce so much about the strip printer. Cause I think it was really sold more to folks who weren't even designers, really just a way to get stuff down on the page. Another option was the Veritype headliner. And I, uh, on the right top, right, you'll see the Veritype. The Verityper that I already mentioned, that's for body copy. But if you wanted to basically have, as it says here, a complete composition department, you could have the Verityper and then the Veritype headliner, which um, as you see her holding the strip of type, it, it prints out that strip of type. Um, you select from that plastic disc of typefaces that you see there's a dial there to rotate it back and forth. Um, so that was another option for uh, maybe a little bit more advanced uh, typesetting situation. So uh, moving on, I wanted to share some examples, really fun examples of folks who are using these affordable typesetting methods to get their ideas out, whether they are creative ideas, a lot of them are political ideas, or cheeky ideas, whatever they were. Um, this is a magazine called Amazon Quarterly, which was um, a feminist publication. And uh, you can see they've got a typeset with just, uh, that body copy is just a regular typewriter. You can tell it's not, it's not proportional um, spacing, but then the covers are using dry transfer, most likely. I doubt they were paying, if they were setting their type with a typewriter, I doubt they were paying a typesetter to, um, to set that type. I'm guessing that they went and bought that type at a little shop. And by the way, that page there is part of an article that's teaching you how to make your own publication. So again, it's hmm. that open source mentality of the hippie generation, which I find endearing. And I think it's something that is happening right now as well. Uh, here's another publication, um, The Great Speckled Bird. And you can see there was a lot of mixing of both uh, typewriters with dry transfer, with hand lettering, with photography and illustration all together, just very wild. Um, they weren't being held down by any sort of, by the design community, for, uh, for instance. A lot of these folks were probably, you know, amateur designers. Um, 
gay publications could have access to type and get their ideas out there. So here are a couple that I like. I love the title, Gay Sunshine. Um, <clears throat> and um, let's see, another uh, women's rights or liberation publication off our backs. You can see they use, they almost have this somewhat international typographic style approach. It was like, there's a grid there and there's someone who made this understood type and grids um, and we're using probably a, what is, if, if I'm guessing that's Helvetica um, and they're getting important information out there that this allowed them to do that. Another publication, uh, Bay Area Women's Liberation put out Tooth and Nail and you can see again, set with, set with a typewriter but um, the cover they're using uh, dry transfer. Probably not a designer, but there's something really beautiful, I think, about the sort of naive design, you know, and layout here. Um, here's an example of a more experimental use of dry transfer type. And this would have cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars to send out to a typesetter to get all those different typefaces and mix them all up like that. But you could, if you could go to the shop and you had some other type sheets of type laying around, you could create these, um, almost, this is almost like a Dada uh, layout here where they're just playing with, um, it's almost like the type becomes the voice of, of this poem that they're writing. So this is from a publication called Other Scenes. Um, uh, one thing that, I notice in some of these publications is that they would offer their typesetting uh, um, services. So um, these are these underground publications that probably are either leasing or have bought an IBM Selectric and they're saying they want they need to pay this thing off or they want to make money off of it. So they would have an ad in there that says, um, we can set your type like this or like this or like this. <laughs> Um, you know, and it's nothing too fancy, but it's better than a typewriter. And you would send away, you would send them your manuscript and tell them what you wanted, and, and then it would be mailed back to you. Radical Software was another one I liked. Um, it was actually more about video than, than software as we think about it. Um, but it's, it's basically this sort of like hippie technology publication. Um, a lot of times it, it, it's fun to see the mixed use of dry transfer mixed with maybe an IBM Selectric and then with a regular typewriter. Um, you know, they use what they, ha they could get their hands on uh, to get their ideas out there and they weren't too precious about it. Probably, this is probably the most professional publication that came out of this, these sort of underground publications, but um, Oz, started in Australia, hence the name Oz, but moved to the UK pretty soon after, I think it's first issue. And you can see here like that the cover on the left, which I absolutely adore, is this mix of hand lettered um, type. And then, uh, and then I'm almost certain that they set that with dry transfer because that probably would have cost more than they wanted to pay for that much type. Um, so <clears throat> they definitely utilize some of these, um, these materials. Here is a cover and back cover of Oz. And you can see, again, the mix of dry transfer, you know, the word yes, the word cannabis, the word smile. Those are dry transfer. And then you've got lots of stuff that's hand lettered in there. And it just um, really, you know, it's a bit chaotic, but it really speaks to the era. Another piece of theirs they were trying to be, uh, they were always trying to uh, be shocking. So <laughs> this is one of their covers. It's nicely done. Yeah, actually. yeah. They use color really well. Um, and here's, here's another example, probably set with a Selectric, the body type, and then, um, and then the title set with uh, dry transfer. They got in big trouble. They had an obscenity trial um, that they, they had, they were sued. It was a big thing. If you're interested, you can see all the issues of Oz are online. Uh, here's mm. the first cover actually on the right there. Um, so the folks that work there, like they did have designers, but 
they were working with the means that they had. And in this case, it was dry transfer, pen, and uh, IBM Selectric. Uh, and may I just add that, hey guys, we have three packs of dry transfer to give away if you wanna add some questions in there. So we're gonna give away dry, dry transfer type so you can experience what it's like to use this type nice. of type. I love just sitting down with a sheet and just being really intuitive and playing with it. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. um, another running publication of this era that was running on a shoestring was the Black Panther newspaper, which was designed by Emery Douglas. And it was a mixture of his illustrations, photography, um, and he used, you know, they did not have money to send uh, type out to be set by a typesetter. They may also have had problems getting their work set by a typesetter because not everyone agreed with what they were doing. Um, so here are a couple, uh, here are some of the amazing covers that he, that he designed that, you know, the, the header there up at the top is probably almost all dry transfer. And um, and then you can see like in that middle one, there's some in the pink area, there's some text that was probably set with a, an IBM Selectric. Um, <clears throat> the paper is really celebrated for its evocative imagery. You know, people mostly think of Emery Douglas for his illustrations, but it really had to serve a workhorse purpose of getting the ideas out to their um, their followers or their potential followers. So, I mean, you could order, you could uh, read about what was going on with the movement, but here's like an order form that they probably made with the Selectric, or actually this is probably just a regular typewriter now that I look, yeah, the spacing is not proportional. Um, and he was using, again, like he might've had to have someone else set this on a regular typesetter, uh, a regular typewriter, because someone else was using the Selectric um, he would have to, he was trained himself uh, as a designer, but he had to get the help of other folks who weren't designers. So um, these tools were something that they could use. Here's a um, detail from their uh, list of their, their 10 demands that would show up in every issue. Again, uh, dry transfer type with uh, this, this type look actually looks like fairly proportionate, but you can see the hand, the stuff is underlined by hand. Those aren't perfect lines or done with a ruler most likely. Uh, and then another detail, the header, you can see all these different typefaces. Um, they were gonna pay someone to set all those different typefaces. They did that themselves in their headquarters in Oakland. Um, so eventually um, photo setting, we had those really expensive machines that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, by, the seven, by the time the 70s rolled around, typesetting systems were becoming more affordable and more portable, unlike this machine. This is called the uh, Linotron 505. Um, but I mean, so here you've got a you know, professional machine that could run you up to $146,000. Um, but there were many machines being developed and marketed. Um, this is a chart. It's hanging in my office. That's you can see the I Magazine for scale. It's a huge chart which shows all the commercial typesetting systems that were in existence in 1984. And I mean, imagine right now you you either decide you decide if you're going to get a Mac or a PC. But if you have to buy a typesetting system, look how overwhelming this is. All these different machines with different qualities. Different Maybe they work at a different speed. Maybe they have one has better typefaces than another one. Maybe um, one is much smaller. One is, you know, so um, it could be very overwhelming to select uh, a, a type um, setting system. There were, like I said, some machines that were getting a little more affordable, though. One of the probably the, the most popular was the copywriter, which sold from 5,500 to 20,000 in 1970. And that's still a lot of money, but um, that's something you could, it's a little more doable for a small business, a small, say a small uh, type shop that 
that wanted to set type and, and uh, do that as a service, they could afford this as a setup cost. Um, you could also, as the machines progressed and got better and better, you could, uh, you could buy a used one. And, you know, as people upgraded, you could benefit by buying a used one. That's one thing that I noticed uh, when I was talking to folks in my interviews for graphic needs. The Lino comp came out later as a, um, in response to the copywriter. Um, and it, Better quality, but a little more expensive. And you can see it's still bigger. It takes up more space. Um, yes. Man. Oh, oh, and I want to point out, I love this ad because I'm sorry, I'm going back. Uh, that's Darwin. That's supposed to be Darwin who represents the evolution of the typesetting system. <laughs> Cracks me up. <laughs> um, so another very popular machine was Mergenthaler's VIP. And it offered more robust features than the CompuWriter at a still at a reasonable price. Um, so you can see here this, I mean, the machines become, just get less, more and more nondescript. Um, it's just the casing covers everything. So you can't really see what's going on, but there's a nice image on the right that shows the paper being pulled through. So that's photographic paper that the type would be exposed on. Um, <clears throat> And a lot of people remember using this VIP machine um, as being an affordable source of typesetting. So if you had a small, if you had a small paper that you put out in your town or something like that, you might be willing to put up this kind of money. Um, <clears throat> of course, it wasn't long after that that a new machine landed on the market and really changed the face of the industry forever. And of course, the accessibility to setting type now. Our grandparents set type and children set type, um, but that's another story. <laughs> I'll leave that for another mm -hmm. one. I thought I would leave you with these famous words from Stuart Brand, who again is a publisher of Whole Earth Catalog. For those who have been passion, who have a passion for independent publishing, these words will never cease to be relevant. Stay hungry, stay foolish. And that's. Wow, so interesting. And um, cool. I'll just share this is uh, if you're interested in means is the film I'm working on again that I'm um, intending to finish at the end of February. Um, and I don't go into all of this stuff. I just briefly touch on this, like I'm talking like a few minutes, maybe le like two minutes. <laughs> um, and the film really covers the whole process of professional graphic designers, whereas this talk was more about the folks who. Um, we're getting access to tools and not necessarily trained uh, designers. And um, lastly, I, I just wanted to know, I think I said this at the start, that the section start pages in this publication were set with my IBM Selectric 2 with letter gothic typeface. And uh, I have a little bibliography if anyone's interested in um, books that uh, I, uh, are my sources for this talk. Um, I'm happy to share those with Rachel later if interested. Yeah. Yes, great. Thanks, Thank, Thank you. you. Fire. Unfocus this. Let's turn back on your video here. Let's see if we can see you. Excellent. Good. Good. I, Thank oh, you. Oh, I can't see So, you. guys, like I said, oh, you can't see me. Oh, you oh, can't I, see okay, me. No, I can. There we are. <laughs> it's gotten dark here. So, me too. Uh, the, light, the light has changed. <laughs> So as I mentioned, we have some dry transfer packs. For anyone who wants to ask a question, we'll give away some. We have three of them, so the first three questions. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, but I have some questions for you, okay. Briar. So, so I mean, I find that, you know me, I find that so interesting about, about uh, graphic design before the computer. When you were doing your interviews mm -hmm. with people who were working in this time, like what, what were some of the more interesting, what, what were the more surprising things that you found out? or stories that you heard? Well, I think for me, um, it's a lot of the stuff that surprises me is just the amount of planning and time that would have to go in. You you can't just decide to print something out on a whim. You have to um, you know, prepare your manuscript, then deliver that to someone who will then typeset it, unless you're one of these indie newspapers. But the, for, for the top, for professional designers, it was a very, big process that involved a lot of folks from typesetter to your paste up artist to 
Um, of course, anyone you're hiring to make art, like photographers, illustrators. Um, so it's, it's the time that, that I find fascinating. It must have been nice. We didn't have to get things out and just- That's right. Hours. I think that was a really hard thing to get used to is this idea that uh, you can do it all yourself. And now clients think we can do it in an instant. And that's not true either. It takes time to come up with concepts and to really think about it. I think a lot of design that comes out now is less deliberate because we don't have that time to really think about it, to really plan it out maybe as much as we'd like. Not everyone, but you know, it's, it is easy to get sort of swept up like, oh, I'll just, I can just get this out real quick. Yeah. Right. right. I want to ask you guys uh, in the audience if you've ever done any of this paste up. If you, I guess that's going to age people, right? It will, will, will tell their age whether they've done paste up or not. I, mean, I did a little bit, in school, but that was just about it. I have, I have a little example here of a paste up uh, mechanical. So this is how you would provide your artwork to a printer who would then photograph each layer. So photograph this layer and then photograph this layer by itself. And then you have two, you can make two um, plates from that to print in two colors. And some of the mechanical mechanicals had more than just two layers. Like oh, yeah. there would be a layer where you could actually mark up and then layer with with the crop marks. Yeah. Absolutely, mark that is a very simple paste up, that very simple. Did you make that? No, uh, someone here named Cece Cutsforth here in Portland made it and she demos, there's a demo of her making this in the, in my film. So that that's, oh, yeah, that's, that's from the film. So how, who did you interview in the film that you found? I mean, that was just interesting yeah, yeah. to you. Um, well, I, it was very exciting because I got to choose who I interviewed. And so I chose, I chose folks that I, oh, many of whom I have looked up to for a really long time. So and the two big ones for me are Ellen Lupton and Adrian Shaughnessy. Um, Ellen's work as an educator is really inspiring. And I use her text thinking with type and class. And um, I like her theories on designer as author. I feel like I'm a, des I'm a designer as author kind of person. Um, Adrian Shaughnessy makes the most beautiful design books out there. And he does that because he didn't, he saw a hole in the market uh, that publishers weren't making the books at the quality that he wanted and with the direction that he wanted. And so he did it and now he totally controls his, you know, he gets to design or write the things that are of interest to him. So he's his own client and that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. That's the goal in life, isn't it? It is, it is. <laughs> and he's living that dream. Was he, did he ever typeset any of the, or did he do any yes. of the books way back before the computer? Yes, he, he's been working since, he talks about in the film making uh, designs where he was trying to rough things up so they look kind of punk. And the typeset type, uh, the folks in the um, printer not understanding, they'd say, oh, we've cleaned up your type for you. And he'd say, no, it was supposed to be like that. Don't, don't, don't change it. Um, so yeah, he's been, he's been designing since the seventies. Now he is mostly a writer and an editor. Mm -hmm. Um, and he works with spin, uh, design who they design the books and Adrian, uh, generally writes the books. So it's pretty, Do you speak with any type good. designers who, who were doing, who were making typefaces during the photo setting years? I did. I spoke to two typeface designers from Letraset. And um, they're wonderful. And they talk about how, you know, at first they were just translating the existing typefaces that were already in metal. So they would say, we need to make a letter set version of Garamond. So that's what they would work on. But eventually they started designing a few of their own faces and those were really popular. And they could make these wild typefaces at a fraction of the cost. So that's why if you look through a letter set catalog, um, it's just chock full of some really imaginative, you know, f some of them are just ridiculous, unusable, but some of them are, are just so charming and they could do that because they, uh, the cost was so much lower. Right. 
Yeah, Patrick just says that they learned, he learned pace step skills when he was studying photography in college. It's really cool and helped build our negatives. Yeah, you know, we had a stat machine actually in one of our high school mm -hmm. rooms. It was really cool. I mean, at first it, it wasn't as a student, scary. but after a while yeah. you're like, yeah, it's kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's machine. just like like a fancy copier that they could mm -hmm. uh, they could make uh, a lower quality reproduction of an image to put in paste up and then you'd actually have to ask your your printer your the people doing pre press to put that the actual high quality image in there. So like um, this, this would be like a photo stat, you could just take a, a photo stat of this image from a catalog of of uh, clip art and paste it down and then say uh well some people use photostats the quality was good enough depending on how how quality driven your publication was right those uh, early publications you were showing us uh the gay ones and you know the punk they'll ones, use whatever they can get their hands on were they considered zines that were they called zines at the time or no no i think the term zine probably came about in the 90s okay. but now it would be I would call them that, even though that's not a word they used then. I think they called them, they often call them uh, newspapers or um, yeah, underground press was a term for the yeah, or magazine maybe. Yeah, cool, love it. Let's see. So Patrick has asked a question. I'm never gonna answer it. Okay. I know we're going over time, guys. So sorry about that. So Patrick asked. It seems. There was a lot of trust needed between designers, paste-up artists, and clients with past techniques. Yes. How do you think this level of trust has changed now that WYSIWYG design, uh, that we have WYSIWYG design, and how is that helping slash hindering us? That's a good question. Yeah, you used to have to have a very close relationship with these vendors, um, like your typesetters. Um, so you would send off your manuscript and say, I want this type face at this letting this line length but they might give you suggestions and say actually you might want to do this this is you know they're they were very um they worked only with type so they were good at, at figuring that stuff out now you're on your own you know you have to know yourself there's no one you can lean on that's why you have type ed <laughs> and that's why you know you go to school but if you if you never learn that um you might be missing some of those things. You might wonder, well, why isn't my work looking as good? And it's it just takes time and also, and those typesetters, that's all they did all day was look at type. So you don't have that kind of relationship anymore. You can have it with your printer. Your printer could help you make choices or help your help you make your work look good. But um, yeah, I mean, now you have to do the ideation, the design, then, uh, make the comps yourself, then get that approved, then do all the production work yourself, whereas it's true, it used to be that you might have someone else, you might do the design and then someone else might take that design and create it for, say it's an ad for a bank. They might take your design, your overall design, and then apply it to 20 different formats and sizes, um, all on paste up. Um, yeah. Imagine if you have to, had to get 20 ads out in a few days and you had to paste them all up. Um, you know, maybe one is, a, is one column and one is a full page and yeah. So we rely on ourselves a lot more. I mean, I'm gonna say I'm happy because I love typesetting. I find it very, uh, I just, it feels zen. You know, I like when I have the design nailed down and I'm just in the typesetting phase, I find it very, um, rewarding and just to see the page come together. Um, if I had to send that out to someone else, like obviously when you don't know any better then that's just how it's done. But if I had to go back to doing that, oh, I would hate it. I love typesetting. Well, I'm glad you like it. There's a lot of agencies yeah. actually have production artists that take care of that stuff. But yeah, I agree that you need to have some trust. Um, back then you also had to work with writers and now we're just mm -hmm. expected do all that stuff for so yeah yeah and that's a that's a slippery slope because you got to make sure you're not liable for typos and stuff <laughs> so do you feel like um what you're just asking that it's more hindering us than helping us or i think 
let me put it this way. I didn't work in that era, but everyone that I asked mm -hmm. said they would not return to really? it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had yeah. one person, I had one person who misses the physicality of it or a couple designers who missed the physicality of it, but no one who said, I wish I, we were working like that. You know, everyone loves their computer. <laughs> oh, that's sure. good. Yeah. I'm sure there's some people who don't like their computer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I miss the fact that, I mean, my office is full of stuff. I'm looking around, but, uh, you know, the truth is I don't have cool pens everywhere. And, and, you know, I have, you should see in the back there, my, those are, um, some French curves that I ordered. They're just hanging on my wall. They're from Russia. Cause I just like the colors and everything, but I don't use French curves in my work. Um, and that probably people miss that if there was a, production area people gather there and it's oh I'm doing right. production work you know it doesn't really work like that anymore you're just in your little computer space I know I wonder if the, uh, design has become less social because of that yeah. Sure. yeah yeah I just well, work in my little change that. <laughs> yeah. okay so well uh, we're over time guys so thanks for hanging out and Briar thank you so much for for sharing more thanks. about the I know it's amazing so I know we should. <laughs> Patrick says <laughs> we should start taking smoke breaks. Oh, I just if you if you find this stuff fun, you might like to show uh, the Good Girls Revolt because there's it, it's about like a Newsweek type magazine and they're doing this kind of work. So if you there's a lot of smoking in that show. <laughs> Is it out right now? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Oh, okay. It. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they were filming that around here in LA. So oh, really? okay, yeah, yeah that's. So 1960s time, right? Yes. 60, uh, 60, yeah, 60? 69, 70, yeah. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, definitely, uh, we'll keep it out uh, for looking for the Graphic Means um, film, of course, which is going to be released now in February. Yeah, March. Yeah, I finished yeah, in March. February. Finished in February. And uh, when do you think that you'll be here in L.A. to screen it? Uh, I mean, definitely next year. Definitely next year, maybe maybe summer. That okay. that would be that would be ideal. Yeah, and yeah, I live, and I don't live far from there, so I'll be you know some places I'll just be sending it off. But with uh, L.A., I'm going to come there for sure. And if people are interested in screening it in their town, how do they reach out to you? Uh, if you write me at hello at graphicmeans.com, or if you go to graphicmeans.com, there's a place to enter your interest in screening the film. Or um, you can get on the newsletter there so you can get updates. And trust me, I don't, I don't flood your inbox. So really, if you just want to know when the movie's coming out, get on, on that mailing list would be a good idea. And your trailer is already out circulating too, right? Yes, yes. You can go watch the trailer at the website. Well, very cool. All right. Thanks, well, thank Rachel. you. Have a good night. I appreciate your time. Okay, bye. Okay, bye, everyone.